see if we can do another year. Welcome back. Good to see everybody. What do people say when, when people come the first time for a presentation as an act of faith? And when they come in for a second one, it's an act of mercy. <laughs> appreciate, you, your, your, appreciate you coming back. Uh, oh, uh, Carol did run from last week's lecture. Uh, she ran all the PowerPoints, uh, which was basically the entire lecture. So if you want a copy from last week, uh, just leave them up here. Uh, but it's, it's uh, actually the PowerPoints that we used. Last week, uh, probably not a lot of, or there wasn't a lot of discussion, was life history. I mean, that's, this is basically the history. This is what happened. Uh, starting this week, we'll be getting into more of what Bonhoeffer taught, more of what he believed. Uh, and so I'm guessing uh, that that will stimulate more conversation. I'll be surprised if we don't get a few. He said what? Uh, you know, any, uh, so I I'm, I'm, uh, I'm think we'll do some of that. Here's the schedule. Uh, again, last week we did the Life of Deeds of Bonhoeffer. Today we're going to take a look at Chief Grace, a uh, phrase for which uh, Bonhoeffer has become quite well known. Next week we'll look at uh, who is Jesus Christ for us today. Uh, and actually, for Bonhoeffer, his understanding of Christ very quickly moves into his theology of the church. And so uh, we'll do Church and Christ on one night. And then October 8th, we will do the world come of age in non-religious Christianity. Uh, and if we don't at least shake our heads a little bit, we'll laugh when they'll be surprised. That uh, he's got a few interesting concepts there. Uh, and then the last night, we'll do the ethics. We'll take a look at, uh, at how Bonhoeffer approached ethics. Uh, so we should, uh, should cover a lot of ground. Any, uh, any questions? From uh, from last week, before we uh, before we officially get started here, I've, I've always said when there's no questions, it either means I have been crystal clear, uh, or I've got everybody so dark I'm befuddled they don't even know where to ask. Yeah, and I'm not, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I have a question. Uh, when you were talking about the assassination attempt on Hitler, on Hitler, mm -hmm. the bomb, um, that was when Bonhoeffer was in prison. Was he? involved in that indirectly or at all? Or how his, his job, uh, and he did it uh, did it actually prior to being arrested, his job was to tell them to uh, communicate to the Allies that they were going to try to assassinate and overthrow Hitler. So he was not involved in the actual, in fact, they joke in some of the letters he wouldn't know how to pull the trigger on a gun. Uh, but uh, So he wasn't involved in the actual attempt to take Hitler's life. Uh, he, his involvement was to try to notify the Allies that we're going to do this. Uh, and please be ready for it. When Hitler is overthrown, you know, give us give us a break. Yeah. So was, the, was his subsequent um, uh, when he was put to death by the by the Germans right anymore? Was that related at yeah. all to that assassination? Yeah. I mean, how, did, how was that yeah. related? I mean? Yeah. They uh, actually one of the uh, one of the conspirators kept a diary, oh. and uh, the, the Gestapo's got their hand on the uh, on the diary. And it listed who all the contacts were. Von Hoffer's name was there. He was already he was already in prison, so he didn't have to go how far to to, to find him. Uh, but it, it changed when he's in Tango prison. He's treated very well. Once they realized he was part of the conspiracy, then he's at the mercy of the Gestapo. Then it's then it's the very traditional concentration camp interrogation, all, all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah. There is a movie that came out recently, or a couple years ago, called Valkyrie. involved that was uh, uh, July 20th, 1944. And they actually, the, the, this uh, Stoltenberg who planted the bomb, had tried an earlier attempt on Hitler, and that fizzled also. There were a number of attempts on Hitler's life, uh, but the closest was this July 20th. They, uh, they, they shattered Hitler's bunker, uh, but Hitler survived. Yeah? It seems like it was so close. Mm -hmm. I think the Americans got the got the plot to work first. Yeah, it was, the, the war was over. The war, the war was, was over. over. Yeah. Hitler's some of one of Hitler's final attempts was to try to kill everybody that had been involved in the conspiracy against him. There was there was no point to it. I mean, the war was over and everybody knew it. Um, he was he was going to get him before he uh, before he died. Well, let's get it 
some new material, shall we? Let's see what we've got to say. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Holy God, we give you thanks as we gather this night. We ask that, that you would speak your word to us, that you would focus us on you. Use the, the example in the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer to point us to your resurrection and, and to your hope. For in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, another picture of Bonhoeffer. This was actually taken at Tango Prison in uh, 1944. Uh, thinner there than some of the other pictures. Uh, but one of the uh, one of the last pictures of Bonhoeffer. I want to start out tonight with some historical background. Uh, one of the things that forms Bonhoeffer's spot in writings is his reacting to a theological movement called German liberalism. Uh, and you've really got to understand German liberalism before you can understand Bonhoeffer. Uh, you get the liberalism down, then you know what he's, he's operating against. So I want to take probably 15 minutes and go through what German liberalism was. Uh, it actually went by a variety of names, German liberalism, Protestant liberalism. It was really the prevailing theology in Europe for most of the 19th and the early 20th, 20th century. Uh, very prominent in Germany, prominent in this country, Union uh, Seminary in New York. Uh, was very much teaching it. Uh, it was the, the main theological movement in Europe for, for over a century. Now, i got to be a little careful. When you use the word liberalism, it's not exactly liberal, conservative, you know, blue state, red state, like we get in this country. Uh, but it is the name for a, for a fairly liberal uh, theological movement. Very prevalent in, uh, in uh, 19th century Germany. Liberalism was basically a result of science and the Enlightenment. <laughs> and what it, what it said was that traditional Christian doctrine just isn't working. There, there's been enough advances in human understanding uh, and human thought that we have to modernize the way the church speaks of itself. We have to be able to speak in language of, of the 20th century. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. I think the church always has to be speaking its message in a term that the culture can underhear. Can hear. And so some, some examples of what uh, of where you get uh, traditional Christian doctrine having to be updated, uh, obvious one is, is early on in, in uh, Christian history, heaven is up here, hell is down here, and the earth is a flat thing in, delay, in, uh, in between, right? I mean, very, very, very easy. Uh, well, guess what? Somewhere along the line we discovered the world is round. Uh, that, that doesn't work anymore. Huh. A little more serious, remember Galileo? Uh, comes to the conclusion that the earth is not the center of the universe and the church, well, they, they excommunicate, I don't think they put them to death, uh, but the church doesn't, the church doesn't like that. Uh, advances in science question uh, the church's worldview. Or for another uh, doctrine of uh, political theology. For many centuries the church, church taught the kings ruled by divine right. Right? Why, are, why do kings get to rule and the rest of us are peasants? Well, it's divine right, it's given them by God. Uh, they, they have the right to rule. The United States put that one to death. You know, in the, uh, with our Declaration of Independence, uh, it's not that the rulers have divine rights, it's that every human being has certain inalienable rights. And uh, political theology had to change. Or, if you go back to New Testament times, any mental illness is understood as demon possession. You know, by the 20th century, it's understood that what would have been called demon possession back then, you know, now we would use, use language of of, uh, of some sort of mental illness. And so what the liberal theologians said was, we've got to re-express what we believe in a way that a scientific and modern mind can hear it. Otherwise, the church gets to be the group using the these and thou's language. You know, nobody knows what they're talking about. So we have to re reinterpret our message uh, for a modern day. Another way that they put it is theology is to be done in light of advancing knowledge of science, reason, psychology, etc. As human knowledge increases, we have to take that into account. Right? I mean, our church has started to use Facebook and uh, and emails and all that good stuff. You got it. You got to take advances into account. That's not a bad thing. Problem that the liberals got into is it's not much of a jump from saying that until science, reason, and psychology and history become more important than theology. And then all of a sudden things have shifted, and you got yourself some problems. The initial effort was to just update theological language, theological thought. He said there are two areas in particular that have to be updated. Theological, what we believe, and biblical, how we understand and study the Bible. And so what the liberal, the German uh, liberal theological movement said was a number of emphases 
One was, uh, uh, when it comes to religion, let's get the general essence of religion. Let's get all religion, real effort to pay attention to all religion. You know, don't, don't just focus in on Christianity. Let's find out what the essence is of all the great religions of the world, and let's lift that up as, as being most important. And so religion is about the fatherhood of God, or the love of God, or the brotherhood of humankind. Uh, religion, uh, they, they kind of wanted to extract the essence that all, all religions would come up with. Sin was understood as ignorance. As ignorance. That if people would know the right, they would do it. And so sin was lack of education, lack of training. If you didn't know, if you didn't know right from wrong, the, the answer to sin was education, training. <coughs> also, more of an emphasis on sociological sin, on societal sins, than individual sins. Pendulous, rather than an emphasis, sin is not so much what you do in your own, own life, it's, it's problems in society. Jesus becomes the supreme example of faithfulness and love. And there's different ways of interpreting Jesus within, within this whole movement. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, he, he's basically a human figure. He's the ultimate example of what faithfulness to God can do. He reveals God's love. He reveals God's compassion. Jesus becomes the supreme example through whom we can see who God is. Also, a heavy emphasis on social action. The church has to get into the world and do something. A uh, questioning of traditional creeds and beliefs. A uh, real question, you know, uh, given the advances of science, are some of these traditional beliefs valid anymore? And more of a human-centered view of the universe. That theology starts with humankind. Given what we know, given what we understand, that's where we start, and then we work out into the equation. But really a human-centered view of, uh, of the universe. That's the theological. The biblical is they said, well, let's start using it. We've got some great advances in science and history and archaeology and all those things. Let's use some things to critique the Bible and see where it takes us. And by the way, folks, I am very well versed in This is what I learned at seminary. But I don't know if they were doing all this nonsense when you were there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm raised on this stuff. This is what, what, what we were, were raised in. And the, the, the thought was to use science, history, use the best of that, critique, critique scripture. I still remember, as a first-year seminary student, uh, some arch Remember this, the story in, in uh, uh, Joshua of uh, uh, the people of Israel walk around the walls of Jericho and they shout and they make noise and the walls come and tumble down. Is that old? Is the walls come and tumble down? You know, the, the people, Joshua leads the, what is it, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls come down and, and, and all, that, uh, all that good stuff. I mean, they have, all every Sunday school kid knows that. When I was in seminary, the first year there, an archaeological team went over to Israel, dug up around Jericho, couldn't find any destruction from that the, the appropriate time period, and announced Joshua was wrong. There was no battle with Jericho. And I'm this first-year seminary student going, you know, the Bible is wrong. Why didn't anybody tell me before I got here? You know, it, 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 just, it, it wasn't one of those good moments in my life. It, interesting. Twelve years after I graduated, twelve years, I followed this stuff. I kind of, you know, it, it got to me. Twelve years after I graduated, another team went to Jericho, dug deeper, Guess what they found at the appropriate level? A whole level of destruction. Wow. <laughs> uh, what Protestant liberalism did was use the advances of history and science to try to critique the Bible. Sometimes it was helpful, sometimes it wasn't. Another example where that happens is you get the book of Genesis talking about creation in seven days. You know, well, how in the world is that going to square with the theory of evolution? You get into some of those, some of those discussions. A lot of focus on the words of the Bible rather than the word. Word with a capital W, I mean, it's God's word. You know, the Bible is God's word for us. What these scholars did was really got into the nitty-gritty of the scripture. And so they would wrestle with things like in the book of Isaiah, there's some real different sections that sound very different. Was there just one person Isaiah, or was there two or three Isaiahs that came into one book? I mean, that was a major question. Or on Easter, on Easter, who was at the tomb? When the women got there. Book of Mark says there was one young man in a white robe. Luke says there were two angels. Or when did Jesus when did Jesus clean the temple? Uh, Gospel of John says it was it was right before his crucifixion. Excuse me, Gospel of John says it was the first thing he did in his ministry. The other gospels say it was right before his crucifixion. And and so this movement would I mean would, would, would work and all that. And those are good questions and fair questions. But in the midst of it they kind of lost sight of the bigger question, like what does God have to say to us today? All these changes and advances 
uh, going on in, in discipline. One of the prominent uh, liberal theologians in the 20th century, uh, biblical scholar Rudolf Boltzmann, uh, uh, I mean, very, very influential, and his thing was the story of the resurrection uh, needs to be demythologized uh, because it's basically an ancient myth that nobody understands anymore, uh, and so get rid of it and ask more pertinent questions. And my response to Boltzmann is, you know, that's that, that, not you can't have but all of that comes into play under this topic of liberal theology. Karl Barth, great uh, Swiss theologian, start of the 20th century, is the first to challenge this. Barth says, basically, you guys are nuts. Uh, you know, we got to get back to a biblical faith. Bonhoeffer was a student of Barth and a close friend of Barth's. And so Bonhoeffer and Barth really were the two that challenged this whole mindset. And so what Bonhoeffer would say in response to, do we emphasize the general truths of all religion? He would say, no. You focus in on Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one that God, through whom God reveals himself. Bonhoeffer hated abstract thought. Anything in the abstract just drove him nuts. One of his buzzwords was reality. The Christian faith is real living for real people in a real world. It really happened. It's got to be grounded in reality. So if you want to know what God is about, don't get all the great doctrines of all the great world religions. Rather, look to a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Or look to a person preaching a sermon on the mount of a side, on the side of a Galilean hillside. Or most profoundly, look at a cross just outside of Jerusalem. You want to know who God is? It's that person on the cross dying for you. Forget all the abstract thought. Jesus is God's revelation. <coughs> Sin, uh, the, 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 the teaching was ignorant there, it needs to be, uh, needs to be uh, education. Bonhoeffer said no. It gets back to a very traditional understanding, which is sin is much deeper than that. Biblical understanding of sin is that it's defiance, it's rebellion, it's a power that basically controls this world, and you can't educate yourself out of it. Kind of like, any of you are, ever had kids that were two years old? <laughs> and you look at them, and you tell them what to do, and they look you in the eye and say, no. <laughs> well, wasn't just my kids that did that, huh? <laughs> they know what to do. It's defiance. It's in your face. I'm not going to do it. How are you going to make me? That's sin, Bonhoeffer says. It's us looking God in the face and saying, no. No, I'm not going to do it. It's something deep within it. There's a fundamental brokenness in human life. You know, and in fact, I, I think about this when I look at, at, uh, at, at how the Middle East is erupting right now. I mean, that's, geez, what a mess. Uh, I am reasonably convinced that it's not a failure of their educational system. You know, you're not going to get over there and educate themselves out of it. The problem is much, much deeper. This whole world is just kind of messed up. Uh, and so Bonhoeffer gets back to, uh, back to traditional Christian, traditional Lutheran understanding uh, that, that sin is rebellion. It's this, this deep power that messes up life, and it's both individual and communal. Yeah, there's the societal sins, of course. There's also individual sins. It's a both and category. Yeah, girl? Bless Bonhoeffer's heart, then, because for most of his life, not only was he fighting the Nazis and, and that in Europe, he was also fighting most of his colleagues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his initial fight is, is with Protestant liberalism that gets transformed into a, into a, into a fight against uh, Nazism. One of the interesting movements that, 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 that a lot of scholars have brought up is that this theological liberalism left the German church so weak it had nothing to stand on against Hitler. That once you've taken Jesus and the Word of God out of the equation, you've got no, no foundation. And so when Hitler comes in and says, here's what you're going to believe now, there was no basis for the Lutherans in Germany to resist that. And they did. They did. Sin's rebellion, Jesus certainly is the supreme example of faithfulness and love. Bonhoeffer would say he's more, he's the Son of God. He is God's Son, he is Lord. All the traditional language, uh, uh, he is... Uh, one of the things uh, liberalism can do is if you weaken sin, you can weaken Jesus. You know, sin is just ignorant, you don't need a Savior. If sin is that powerful, it's the Son of God to redeem us. Uh, and so Bonhoeffer recaptures a sense of sin, also recaptures a strong sense of who Jesus is. Uh, Protestant liberalism has a heavy emphasis on social action. Bonhoeffer maintains that. Bonhoeffer maintains that. He says, church, you've got to get into the world. If the church is only taking care of itself, it has no right to call itself the church. 
that Jesus very intentionally died for those who were not faithful and not worthy, the church always has to get into the world. And so Bonhoeffer maintains that emphasis. Uh, tradition, question of traditional creeds and beliefs. Bonhoeffer wants to maintain the tradition. He never, never throws away the Christian tradition, although he does want to re-express it. He does want to re-express it in different terms, but never gets rid of the tradition. And finally, uh, instead of a, a human-centered view of the universe, he says, no, you start with Jesus. You don't start with the wealth of human experience. You start with Jesus Christ. It, Jesus is the one whom God has sent to teach us what God is about. Jesus is the one whom God has sent to teach us what the world is to be about. And so faith starts with Jesus. Here. Real change in how you do things. When it comes to the biblical stuff, uh, Bonhoeffer says, sure, use every historical and scientific tool you can with the Bible. You know, of course, if, if the Bible truly is the Word of God, then we got to read it, study it, and examine it from every angle we can. Of course, use all that. But, <laughs> but, never forget that this is God's Word and let it change. Never forget that. Primarily, this is the Word of God, and it's got to be at the center of who we are. And so Bonhoeffer has, and you know, he's running the seminary, he has his students meditating, meditating, I'm <laughs> meditating, meditating on passages of scripture. Uh, he has uh, his students studying scripture. When, when I was in seminary, you, we'd give sermons, and then we'd critique each other, you know, that was good, that was bad. Uh, when Bonhoeffer uh, ran his seminary, he would let no one critique a sermon. Because the sermon is the word of God, you don't critique it. And so one of Bonhoeffer's movements was, uh, you've got to restore the centrality of the word of God. The other thing that kind of ruined Protestant liberalism was World War II. <laughs> it's, uh, Protestant liberalism was a very optimistic view. You know, a human-centered view of the universe is good enough. Sin's not that bad. We can make ourselves better. I mean, World War II shot that apart. Once you watch what the Nazis did, you cannot say that uh, sin's not that bad. So World War II was instrumental in ending that. Yeah, Blaine? Um, World War, why was it World War I? Uh, that there is no extinction, 
of uh, liberal Protestantism is making a good comeback. In fact, the bottom box says, a sort of neoliberal Christianity has quietly taken root across the old Protestant denominations. And folks, it is alive and well in this country. It actually is a very... A lot of the arguments that you're seeing in the religious sphere, uh, sphere in America nowadays are, are traditional theology versus liberalism. And it's one of the reasons I feel obligated to teach Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer's got a message we got to hear. we got to hear stuff that goes into life and well. <coughs> anyway, that's a whole lot of background. Questions, comments? Or disturbed everybody? Confused everybody? <laughs> Let's get into Bonhoeffer. <laughs> one of the things that Bonhoeffer is very well known for is uh, what he calls the concept of cheap grace. And he actually critiques cheap grace versus cost of grace. And where he writes about this extensively is in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He has a famous quote where he says, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. So what is cheap grace and costly grace? Let me give you Bonhoeffer. Pass out, please. Okay. And I'll give you a few minutes to read this. His writing is much more eloquent than my speaking. <coughs> this is actually out of the uh, cost of discipleship. Let's take a couple minutes to read it, and then we'll... Uh, and we'll see if we can pull it all apart. Yeah. Uh, the question is what? Yeah. Humanistic approach to psychology probably predates this. Probably predates this. Yeah. Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer is not real pleased with psychology and, uh, and uh, the philosophical movement of existentialism. He thinks that there are some avenues that are often used to discredit the theory. So it's not a big thing for him. Take a moment if you would. Did, did, did they get to the back? Did they get, oh, they didn't get. Oh, this way. Goodness. Yeah. 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 Ah, I'm sorry.
going away? Nope, they're good. Okay, should we go over this and see what the... Let me see if I can attack some of that. I just thought Bonhoeffer wrote it a little more eloquently than I could, uh, than I could put it. Bonhoeffer was convinced that what is the biggest challenge for Christianity in his time, and I would probably add for us today, is what he called cheap grace. Cheap grace is grace without obedience. It's grace that needs little and changes less. Some examples of cheap grace. Anybody here watch Boston Legal? I love Boston Legal. I just absolutely, Denny Crane is one of my heroes. You know, it's that goofy <laughs> show of you know, lawyers. And, uh, there is a scene a number of seasons ago where Denny uh, and Alan Shore are sitting on the balcony smoking their cigars, talking about philosophy, and Alan asks Denny, do you believe in God? And Denny replies, yes, I'm a Lutheran. Denny's <laughs> <laughs> Denny, a Lutheran. I didn't, didn't know that. Uh, and then Alan pushes him on it and says, you know, really? You know, you're, 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 you're Lutheran, you believe in God, you know, I don't get it. And then he responds, he says, yeah, he says, what I figure I'm doing is I'm covering my bets. If there, if there, uh, if there is no God, I haven't wasted much time on it. But if there is a God on the judgment day, I can say I was Lutheran and believed in you and I'm covered. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice little caricature of what cheap grace is. It's faith that means very little and changes even less. Or for another example, it's faith without obedience. It's faith, I believe in Jesus, I'm a very good Christian, I just don't bother to do any of the things that Jesus tells me to do. Uh, for some other examples of cheap grace, do whatever you'd like to do. You know, God's going to forgive you anyway. You know, that's, that's kind of God's job. God is one who forgives. Uh, and so, you know, do whatever you want during the week. Sunday morning you get forgiven for it. And by the way, that doesn't start with us, that doesn't start with Bonhoeffer, that's the issue in 1st and 2nd Corinthians in the New Testament. You know, in, in the, the Corinthian church must have been an interesting place. I mean, they're, they're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. Uh, they have some sexual involvement that would make us blush. I mean, and their theory is, well, we're forgiven anyway. You know, what's the problem? Paul goes crazy. You know, Paul goes crazy. You did not so learn Christ! Uh, you know, you cannot call yourself Christian and keep doing all this crazy stuff. Christianity demands obedience. Another example of cheap grace, uh, from, from as far as I can tell from all the Gallup polls, 75 to 80 percent of all Americans still claim to be Christian. I think that number is dropping, but the vast majority of Americans claim to be Christian, but less than half can name the four Gospels. 60 percent of Americans, 80 percent claim to be Christian, 60 percent cannot name five out of ten commandments. Well, it's pretty hard to obey Jesus if you don't know what he's telling you to do. Uh, what is it? 60% of Americans don't know that German Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> We've got a generation that claims to be Christian, but really doesn't know much about the Christian faith. Bonhoeffer would say, cheap grace. Other examples. Uh, and this, this is for, for denominations uh, like Lutherans that baptize infants. <coughs> You get the idea that, that people have to have their child baptized, even there is there is no intention of, of raising them in, in faith. You know, they, they just just to cover the bats, it's almost any we have to get the child baptized. It's almost kind of an insurance policy. You know, if we get the child baptized, uh, we have no intent that we're going to actually raise them in the faith. Uh, we just simply want to uh, you know, we just want to cover those bases just in case. Yeah, but right? I say more about parents or about the congregation. Ah, uh, the question was, does that say more about the parents or the congregation? Uh, uh, it certainly says something about the parents. Uh, and does it say something about the congregation? When when we baptize infants, the parents promise that they will raise the child in the faith, and the congregation supports them in that promise. And if we don't just, I mean, we don't just stand outside the hospital and baptize every kid coming out. Uh, it's based on the parent's commitment that this child will be raised in faith. It's what Bonhoeffer says here, it's baptism without church discipline. You know, it's, it's just, well, it's, 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 there, there's, yeah, we baptize based on that promise and that commitment. And granted, parents aren't going to do it perfectly. Nobody's a perfect parent. But that's, that's, uh, 
And the other is, and, and I think this is this is out of, actually out of liberal theology, and it's big in our culture too. Sin isn't that big a deal. Those of you that can remember the 1960s, you know, sin is just it's just not that big a deal. Uh, you know, we can tolerate about anything. Things that traditionally the church said are wrong now aren't that bad. Uh, and, and self-justification is plays into that too. You know, I can justify just about every wrong thing I've ever done. Uh, and you, you, they're all examples of, of, of a grace without an obedience. You kind of get what he's talking about. Yeah. You know, when you start talking about cheap grace. Absolutely, an example of that also is baptism. Yeah. You know, the, the question was, would an example of that be do I, I take communion once a year just to be on the safe side? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Bonhoeffer's response to that is grace is not cheap, it is costly. No, it's still grace, it's free, you can't buy it. But it's costly. In the first place, it's costly to God. God doesn't give this stuff at no price, it costs him the death of his son. God's own heart is literally ripped out to make this happen. If, if in order for grace to be given, it's incredibly costly to God our Father. And, second, it's costly to us. It's costly to us. It will mark the end of our life as a sinner and the start of a new life in Christ. That to be Christian means that I now confess my sin, I turn that over to Jesus and say, Jesus, make me into what you want me to be. It's, and, and, and it, it, you know, one of, the, one of the traditional definitions of sin is to be turned in on ourselves. It's the self-centered ego that says, I'm going to do it my way, you know, to hell with the rest of you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I want. And grace means, you know, it's the death of that. It's the death of that. That, 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 that dies. As Jesus now says, I'm going to turn you into a very different person who now lives for the sake of others. Costly grace, it's also the death of our self-justification. You know, I am, I, I, I mentioned, I'm very good at justifying myself. Any sin that I've committed, I can pretty much rationalize and tell you why it wasn't that big a deal. <laughs> when you run into the cross, it's God saying, Mark, you are such a sinner that it took the death of my son to redeem you. And all of a sudden, I'm flat, you know. All of a sudden, I don't get to stand on my own ego, and I don't get to stand on my own pride anymore. Cuts away any support I've got, and leaves me nothing to do but fall in the grace of Jesus. But the good news is that's enough. That's enough. Nothing, nothing cheap about grace. It is still grace. Bonhoeffer says, it's still grace. It's Jesus Christ given for you, and his deepest desire is to bring you into that newness of life. But it'll cost you. It'll cost you. Questions on that? Yeah. I know one of, the, one of the men that was here last week, I think he wasn't back, he brought along a little poem called Like a Pumpkin. Huh. Interesting. And I told him it's a nice understanding of cheap and costly grace. What's it like being graced by God's love and forgiveness? It's like being a pumpkin. When God hears your plea for forgiveness, he leans down, picks you up out of the patch, draws you close to him, and washes all the dirt off. Then he cuts off the top where all the hard-headed selfishness was located and scoops out all the yucky stuff. He removes the seeds of greed, prejudice, hatred, vengeance, vengeance, and then he plants the seed of love, compassion, and forgiveness. And then he carves a smiling new face and puts his light inside of you for all the world to see. I mean, that's horrible. But it's kind of nice. We, we like the idea that God gives me new life and life. We don't so much like the idea that scooping all the gunk out. <laughs> but that's biblical thought. We're sinners. We instinctively turned in on ourselves. God gives that out in order that he give us a new life in Jesus Christ. Costly. If it costs God, it'll cost you. And then, one of his famous quotes in the midst of all this, it's in the top of discipleship, Bonhoeffer writes, this is long before he knew what would happen to him, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a person, he bids the person come and die, be willing to give up what you stand for, what you value, die to all that, and now come and live to me. And those words become particularly haunting when you realize what happened to Bonhoeffer. But that says, when Christ calls him, the person who gives him come and die. You know, you won't find that in too many of the TV preachers nowadays. You know, they're the messages kind of, if you send us, if you're faithful, and you send us enough money, you know, 
you are going to be wealthy and healthy, and, and, and God will bless you. Uh, uh, you know, you will get rich and whatever. Uh, you don't get it, but you know, when, when God calls you, He is going to put you in an entirely different direction, and He may just have a cross with your name on it. <laughs> Bonhoeffer also plays with this with, with, with a little wordplay, and he writes, he who believes obeys, he who obeys believes. That the Christian life is both belief and obedience. And Bonhoeffer is one of the few theologians that put those, put those together. What most, what traditional theology says is he who believes obeys. I mean, that's what I was taught in confirmation. Because I believe in Jesus Christ, I will love my neighbor, tithe, come to worship. Because of my belief, I will obey. And that, that's, I mean, that's been taught for centuries. Bonhoeffer says, you bet, absolutely correct. And so is the flip side. That when we obey, we grow in faith. When we obey, faith is strengthened. Obedience leads deeper into faith. And so if my faith is weak, what should I do? Well, read the Bible. Come to worship. Pray. Because all of those disciplines strengthen faith. It's kind of one of the big things in youth ministry now is take the kids on a mission trip. And that's become very, very popular. We're in the process of trying to put one together for our kids next summer. Inevitably, when kids come back from a mission trip, what they say is, we were there to help others, but it was my faith that was touched. <coughs> exactly what Bonham. When you obey, when you do what God tells you, your own faith is, is deepened in the process. And, and so belief and obedience become two points that spiral into each other and pull you deeper and deeper into the new life of Christ. Belief and obedience work together to lead you into Christ. But you cannot have one without the other. With no, with no obedience, all you got is cheap grace. He who believes obeys, he who obeys believes. Right. Yeah? Another way to put that is you can't have the gospel without the law. I was going to say, in, in more traditional Lutheran language, you can't have the gospel without the law. The law is that where God tells you what to do. The gospel is the announcement of what God has done for us. And you cannot have one without another. Yeah, so he's actually being very, very, very Lutheran at this point. Let me look at how some of this plays out in Bonhoeffer's life. 1939, <laughs> actually the year the war began. Uh, 1939, Nazis are in full power. Uh, they completely and totally control Germany. Uh, war is imminent, everybody knows that. Uh, confessing church has been badly weak. By 1939, there's not much going on in the confessing church. Bonhoeffer is in Germany, and he knows that he is going to get drafted. If you are a male in Germany of that age, you're ending up in the army. So he knows that's coming. He also knows he is not going to take an oath of loyalty to Hitler. One of the things uh, that Hitler did is change. You know, when, when you join the military in the United States, you take an oath, don't you, to defend the United States and, and, be, and, and the Constitution? Yeah. Germany had the same thing, except when Hitler came to power, he changed it. And you no longer swore loyalty to Germany, you swore loyalty to Adolf Hitler. And Bonhoeffer said, that's, that's nuts. That's, that's blasphemy. And so Bonhoeffer actually wrestles with the possibility of going in the service. But he said, there's no way, absolutely no way I'm not taking a oath of loyalty to Hitler. His teaching and speaking privileges are being removed. I mean, he's getting boxed in at every front. What does he do? Cool. Uh, before I give you the answer to that, just, I, you know, I... I I've been looking at some pictures from the Nazi era, you know, from, from this time in Germany. And man, I mean, that's impressive stuff. Scary stuff. You look at, I mean, thousands and thousands of soldiers lined up there in front of the swastika. You look at, I mean, that, that, that's powerful. You know, if, if I'm a Lutheran preacher, I've got no support from the confessing church or the other church, I'm looking to take that on. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's at least got my attention. Bonhoeffer looks at all that. June 1939, he leaves Germany for Union Seminary in New York. Some of his friends in, uh, in the United States say, get out of there. You're going to end up in the Army. You're going to end up dead. You're going to end up in a concentration camp. Get out of there. Come over here. You can teach. You can critique Germany. Tell us what's going on. Get out of there. He does. Leaves Germany. Comes over to the United States. He stays for four weeks. Stays for four weeks and heads back to Germany. When he leaves, he writes a famous letter to Reinhold Niebuhr. And what he writes is, I have come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. 
Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either winning the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive, or winning the victory of their nation and thereby destroying civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice for security. And then head back for Germany on the last few years. Isn't that, I mean, what a decision. If I want Western civilization to survive, I've got to pray for the defeat of my own country. That's, that's tough stuff. But what I especially like to look at is the word, I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. He knows war is going to break out. He knows Germany is going to lose. At least he hopes Germany is going to lose. But rather than escape that, he says, if I'm going to help rebuild the place, I've got to share in that. And so he goes uh, back to Germany. Within three years, he is in Hegel prison. And within four and a half years, he's dead. That's Flossenburg concentration camp. That's actually where Bonhoeffer was on, shortly after the Allied Revolution. Using that example, another word for costly grace is discipleship. Costly grace means that we be disciples. And there are a number of things for Bonhoeffer that go into discipleship. <coughs> the first is obedience. He who will be obeys, believes. He who believes, obeys. To be Christian is not just to live lip service to Jesus. It is, it is to give your life over to Jesus. It is to ask, who is Jesus Christ for us today? It is to live completely and totally for Jesus. Discipleship means obedience. Number two, it means a world focus. That we are launched into the world. One of the heresies in the modern church is the church exists to take care of its own. And if that's all the church does, even the church has failed. The church exists to take care of its own, of course, but the church also exists for the sake of the world. In fact, if you notice in Bonhoeffer's thing, why did he return to Germany? Because of the German people. I'm not coming back just for the confessing church. If I'm going to share in the, the, the rebuilding of my country, the world, huh, I have to share in its suffering. And so part of costly grace is daring to open our eyes to the entire world and all that goes on there. Number three is suffering. Bonhoeffer fully expects that if we are faithful to following Jesus, we will suffer for that. Not a novel concept. Jesus says something about if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. And uh, uh, so, you know, it, it, it's nothing new in Christianity, but he expects that there will be suffering. Just a, a note on that. As I look at our changing culture, one of my predictions is there's going to be more and more of that ahead. I, I think, and again, this is a prediction with a quarter of each cup of coffee, uh, but I think there's going to be more suffering, more opposition for Christians as we move on. I would be happy to be wrong with that prediction, uh, but I, I, I suspect that we're going to know more of what that means. And finally, and this one intrigues me, Bonhoeffer says the other part of discipleship is guilt. Taking on and admitting your own guilt. And this is one of those places where I got to struggle with Bonhoeffer and say, wow, I'm not sure, sure I agree with you. But he is absolutely animate that part of being a disciple is simply saying, God, I blew all of it, forgive me. In fact, Bonhoeffer goes so far as saying that as a German, he has to confess all of that guilt to God. And my first response in reading Bonhoeffer is, wait a minute, if anybody in Nazi Germany didn't have to confess to God, it was Bonhoeffer. I mean, he opposes Hitler, gets involved in assassination attempts. Bonhoeffer doesn't have to do that. And Bonhoeffer says, yes, I do. That there is a communal sense of guilt that I share. That I am a German voter, I am a German taxpayer, I am a German national, it's my country that let Hitler get into power. Moreover, Bonhoeffer's got the old European view that aristocracy kind of has a special role in running the country. I, I, don't, I don't quite get that as an American. You know, I'm kind of rooted in democracy and everybody's got an equal voice. Bonhoeffer has the understanding that as aristocracy, you've got some extra responsibility. And he writes that I'm part of the German aristocracy. We didn't do enough to stop Hitler. We share the guilt of that. And so Bonhoeffer says, when you're Christian, whatever you're doing, you're going to end up guilty. Admit it, throw it on Jesus. And I guess I, I struggle with that. But I, I guess I, I can kind of see where he's coming for. My tendency is to do just the opposite. You know, my own individual tendency is to justify myself and point out I really didn't sin. You know, my wife tells me what I did wrong, uh, and I can explain away all that. You know, I, I, am, I am very, very good. I know you other guys wouldn't do. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very good at justifying myself. Bonhoeffer says, don't even try. Don't waste the effort. There is one who justifies, and it ain't you, Brady. <laughs> the only one who justifies is Jesus Christ. And so even in the midst of your holiest moment, recognize the fact you're a sinner and throw it all on Jesus. Ooh, oh, that, does that get a humbling influence on me? But for Bonhoeffer, that, that's costly grace. And again, one of the things that makes Bonhoeffer so fascinating is he lives that out. You know, if he just lays that out in a lecture, that's interesting. When he lives that out, he gets hung for it. That's fascinating. That's, well, that's, that's faith. That's faith. Let me stop with that. That's probably enough for one night questions. Comments? Mark, I'd like to add a little under what you said. I think one of the real things of Bonhoeffer's life is his tremendous patriotism. Yeah. He loved Germany. Loved Germany. And he really had a quandary. And I think that's one reason he went in Avalar as a spy system. He could serve the country and yet you know, be of service to the Allies yeah. and bring about peace. Yeah. But he really suffered a lot in that area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah tremend tremendous, uh, tremendous love for Germany. And then, you know, what do you do in the country you love? You now have to destroy? It's difficult. Very, very difficult. Uh, the Gestapo actually, actually actually arrested him. Yeah, yeah. The Gestapo actually. There's always a rivalry between the Gestapo and the Alvar, uh, and the Gestapo actually did the arresting. But yeah, it, it, it's one of the strange quirks of World War II history. The German military intelligence becomes one of the centers of opposition to Hitler, and it's a lot of their officers that are actually planning the coup attempt, which is just kind of a kind of an interesting quirk of World War II history. I think Uh, Hitler, Hitler had a problem. Some of his best officers, uh, I mean, Hitler's got to control the military and, and never got, the military was always a little bit uneasy with Hitler. And so he had to be careful not to overstep his bounds. Uh, and the same with the German aristocracy. You know, you've got to, if you're going to lead, you've got to have the people behind you. And the, the, some of the power people in the country did not, just did not trust he almost had a revolt. I didn't realize this. When, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, uh, his orders were that all captured Soviet op op officers were to be executed on the spot. No, for a total violation of the Geneva Convention, every Soviet officer to shoot him. And, and he had a, almost had a mutiny in the, in the, uh, the military. All these old Prussian officers were raised in a code of military honor and conduct said, no, we're not, we're not going to do it. And so he finally had to back off on that one. But there, yeah, there's some monsters. And Bonhoeffer plays in that tension. If he, if he, had, I, I, I think it's, if he had been just a normal person, he wouldn't have gotten away with. He would have been, would have been executed a whole lot earlier. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does he speak uh, or write specifically against persecution of the Jews? Yes. Yeah. So it's. I haven't heard anything yet about. Well, yeah. yeah, you will next week. <laughs> yeah, when when uh, when who is Jesus? We take take a look at Christ. Uh, that that then the role of the church. Yeah, we'll get to. Yep. Yeah, very important. If not, and again, if you want some of the stuff from last week, that's uh, that's taking up here. Let's uh, let's close. We'll go to some word of prayer and call it a night. Lord, teach us of the wonder of grace. Teach us of the costliness of the word of grace. And give us the courage to follow you in all of life. Guide us, Lord Jesus, for in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.